Christmas 1989, and the Berlin Wall, symbol of East-West divisions and monument to communist tyranny, cracks. Since the end of the Second World War, the vast territories to the east had been ruled from Moscow by a harsh and often brutal communist system of government. But the communist system was fatally flawed. The theories of Marx and Lenin did not work in practice, and faced with widespread economic misery, ordinary people began to defy the dictators. The Cold War, which had threatened world peace for 40 years, was over, and the barriers that had separated the people of Europe simply melted. Christmas 1991, Maastricht in Holland. Twelve Western European nations agreed moves towards economic and political union. The United States of Europe was becoming a reality. Fifty years ago, the nation states these men now represent were at war. Today, such continental conflict is unthinkable. The face of European and global politics has changed beyond all recognition. In Ireland, memories of old enmities have proved harder to erase. Ulster, the northern province of Ireland, has always been a place apart. Its castles and keeps bear silent witness to a violent history. These six northeastern counties of Ireland formed a self-governing part of the United Kingdom for over 50 years. For most of this time, the region was at peace and its factories and farms enjoyed a relative prosperity. But behind the facade, ancient bitterness between the Protestant majority and the Catholic minority was growing. The bubble burst, and in 1969, British troops and British politicians found themselves once again unwillingly involved in Ireland and the Irish question, a question which remains largely unresolved. A disaffected Catholic minority seeking an end to the British presence in Northern Ireland and an end to a system of government in which they were second-class citizens. A Protestant majority fiercely determined to stay inside the United Kingdom and afraid that a British government would give in to Catholic protests and force them to become part of a united Irish Republic. Today, Northern Ireland is British, but uncertainty about the future remains the most important political issue. Twenty years ago, the British government decided that sectarian violence in Northern Ireland was out of control. Local politicians were brushed aside and since 1972, British ministers have tried to restore and promote dialogue, to find a way by which Catholic and Protestant, nationalist and unionist can agree to share power. Fear, suspicion and mistrust have prevented any of these attempts from succeeding. Politics always returned to the streets, and so it was in 1985 when the British and Irish governments embarked on a fresh initiative, the Anglo-Irish Agreement. The two governments would approach the issue together, with the Irish government having, for the first time, a direct input into the affairs of the province. Unionists were outraged and betrayed. The British government, their government, had abandoned them. The enemy was through the door. Men and women of Ulster, we meet on a very sad occasion. We are gathered here today to mourn the passing of democracy in Ulster. But I stand with the same principle enunciated by Sir Edward Carson in 1912, when he said, if there's going to be a row, I'd like to be in it with the men and women of Belfast. In 1912, at Belfast City Hall, a like-minded crowd gathered for a row. 
Irish nationalists have persuaded Westminster to give their country home rule, limited independence within the British Empire. Led by Sir Edward Carson, Ulster Protestants vowed to resist any move which would weaken the union with Britain. A home rule parliament in Dublin would have a Catholic nationalist majority. Northern Protestants were sure they would lose their religious freedom. They said no, and they were prepared to fight. Carson was a Dublin Protestant and a Unionist MP. Ulster Day, Saturday the 28th of September, 1912. In Belfast City Hall, Carson was the first to sign the Solemn League and Covenant, and all over Ulster, Protestants were signing. They pledged themselves to use all means which may be found to defeat the present conspiracy to set up a Home Rule Parliament in Ireland. They included men of wealth, who feared that a Dublin government would ruin their industries by heavy taxation, and ordinary working men who were certain that home rule would mean Rome rule. By the end of the 19th century, Britain controlled the most powerful empire in history. Britannia ruled the waves and much of the land as well. And although the glory days of empire were beginning to fade, in the face of demands for independence and self-government, Britain's domination of the world stage was a source of pride and profit. And Ulster Protestants shared in this. In the far-flung outposts of empire, from the Indian Raj to the South Sea Islands, Ulster linen, ships, ropes and tobacco were finding a ready market. Royalty were usually given a warm welcome in Ireland, but there was a growing demand by most Irishmen to rule themselves. And now the Liberal government, in alliance with Irish national MPs, was prepared to give the Irish a parliament of their own. Ulster Protestants were prepared to fight rather than be ruled from Dublin. They formed the UVF, the Ulster Volunteer Force, in January 1913, and a year later they smuggled in arms from Germany. If necessary, they were prepared to fight Britain to remain British. Ulster resistance, with popular support on mainland Britain, began to gain credibility. Men shouldered their arms and trained with grim determination. After a long absence, the gun had returned to Irish politics. Nationalists also smuggled in arms for their private army, the Irish Volunteers. By the summer of 1914, Ireland was divided into two armed camps and civil war seemed certain. But civil war was prevented by a greater and more terrible conflict. In August 1914, the world went to war. Amid the barbed wire and butchery of the battlefields of Europe, the divisions in Ireland were forgotten. North and South rallied to Britain's cause, and Irishmen, once prepared to kill one another to promote or prevent home rule, now fought and died side by side. Catholics and Protestants served with courage and distinction, but at a dreadful cost. When the dust of war eventually settled, a generation of Irishmen had been wiped out, united in death. A great many who had joined the UVF had enlisted in the Ulster Division. On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, 5,500 Ulstermen were killed or wounded. For some, England's difficulty was Ireland's opportunity. A small group of militant nationalists organized by the Irish Republican Brotherhood prepared a rebellion in secret. On Easter Monday, 1916, the Republicans seized control of buildings in the center of Dublin and fought to make Ireland completely independent of English rule. They hoped the rest of the country would join them. It did not, and the rebels were quickly surrounded by British troops and pounded by British guns. The insurgents made their last stand in Dublin's general post office, and after nearly a week's fighting, they surrendered. But when the government began to execute the captured Republican leaders, many Irish people came to think of them as martyrs and heroes. Even the early release of prisoners like Countess Markowitz, one of the leaders of the Easter Rising, could do little to stop a strong Republican movement from growing. In the general election of December 1918, the first to give all men and some women the vote, most parts of Ireland voted massively for Sinn Féin, 
the new Republican Party. But they refused to take their seats at Westminster. Instead, they met at Dublin's Mansion House in January 1919 and formed their own assembly, Dáil Éireann, which means the Parliament of Ireland, a parliament which Britain refused to recognise. A year later, the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, offered an alternative, the Government of Ireland Act. Two Home Rule Parliaments, one in Belfast, the other in Dublin. Ulster Protestants agreed, Sinn Féin said no. And when Republicans took up arms again, Lloyd George reinforced the Irish police with British ex-soldiers known as Black and Tans and Auxiliaries. He was determined to stem the Republican tide. The Irish Republican army and British government forces fought with a ruthless cruelty which had not been seen in Ireland for more than 100 years. A treaty signed in December 1921 followed a six-month ceasefire. A compromise settlement was agreed at Number 10 Downing Street. Most of Ireland, to be called the Irish Free State, would become self-governing within the empire, while the six northeastern counties would remain within the United Kingdom, but with its own parliament in Belfast. Michael Collins, who had directed the IRA campaign against the British, felt that by signing the treaty, he had signed his own death warrant. The Irish Free State was still inside the British Empire, and many who had fought to get an Irish Republic would refuse to accept it. The treaty fell far short of their demands. With a heavy heart, the delegation returned to Dublin to be met with the unbending opposition of Eamon de Valera, the president of the Doyle, and many others. It was not the division of Ireland but the fact that the Irish Free State would still be part of the British Empire, which was the major sticking point. The Doyle approved the treaty, but by a perilously narrow margin. In less than six months, a civil war had begun between those who supported the treaty with Britain and those Republicans who were against it. When the Republicans seized the Dublin Four Courts, the Irish Free State Army pounded the building with field guns borrowed from the British. After a few days, the Republicans were forced to surrender. But fierce fighting continued, and now nationalist fought nationalist. Finally, in May 1923, after perhaps 4,000 had died, the Republicans laid down their arms. When King George V disembarked in Belfast to open the first Northern Ireland Parliament in June 1921, he was given a warm welcome by the loyalists of Ulster. The British government had not forced them under the rule of Dublin after all. Catholics, for their part, had little to cheer about. Making up one third of the inhabitants of Northern Ireland, they had no wish to be ruled from Belfast and resented being left to the mercy of a guaranteed unionist majority. Catholic MPs refused to attend the royal opening. In his address to the Unionist MPs in Belfast City Hall, King George appealed to all Irishmen to forgive and forget, and he hoped that his coming to Ireland would be the first step towards an end of strife among her people. The parliament he was opening was to be described later by Northern Ireland's first Prime Minister, James Craig, as a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. And with Catholic representatives refusing to take their seats, and Catholics in general refusing to cooperate with the new institutions of the state, that was effectively what it was. The struggle against Dublin rule had been successful, and the Union Jack was still proudly paraded in Ulster. But the price of freedom was constant vigilance. With bitter fighting continuing between Protestant and Catholic, the Unionist government recognized that strong measures would still be needed in Ulster's defense. They voted themselves special powers to deal with possible Catholic rebellion. Suspects could be locked up without trial. Internment camps surrounded by barbed wire and armed police began to fill up with those suspected of organizing against the state. Behind the wire, conditions were very similar to wartime prison camps. Outside, Sectarian murders reached a peak in the first six months of 1922. 236 people died. In April, the Royal Ulster Constabulary was formed as an armed police force. One third of the places were reserved for Catholics, 
but they were often reluctant or afraid to join. The British government approved a large expansion of the force to deal with the threat from the IRA. The majority of members were part-timers, serving in the Special Constabulary, an exclusively Protestant force. Sir Basil Brooke, a future Prime Minister, commanded the specials in his home county of Fermanagh. They, they were a Protestant force because the Protestants, taking them by and large, were Queen's men. The Roman Catholics, taking them by and large, were for an Irish Republic. Well, now, it'd be very much like having a German in your army uh, as one of your troop leaders. You couldn't have it. In Belfast, tensions were running high. For over a century, Catholics and Protestants, living in their own areas, had clashed with one another again and again. With Protestant political power now firmly rooted, Catholics felt completely isolated. A third of the population felt abandoned by their friends at Westminster and in Dublin, left to the mercy of their loyalist neighbours. To the Protestants, Catholics represented a potential threat to the security of Northern Ireland. Those fears and suspicions were soon passed on to succeeding generations. The city was already highly polarised, with the Catholics living in separate communities. Mixing in housing, schooling, marriage or sport was not encouraged by either side, and where it had taken place, the tensions led to many being forced out of their homes. Evictions and burnings led to even greater community divisions. For several centuries, all of Ireland had been under British rule. Now the country was divided, Protestants in control of the north, Catholics in the south, between them a border. An invisible line snaking through the countryside, dividing villages, farms and even houses. The report of a boundary commission appointed in 1924 to review its location was never published and Catholic hopes that territory would be handed over to the Free State were dashed. Hope, too, that Northern Ireland would collapse from within evaporated as the original frontier was confirmed. From both sides, armed police and troops stared at one another, wondering what the future would bring. There was a feeling of unfinished business. Both new states on the island had been born in violence or the threat of violence and the compromise of partition in haste was fatally flawed. But for the moment, the Irish question was off the British political agenda. Any fresh attempt to come to terms with it properly would have to wait for another 50 years. Thank you.